Well, I want to welcome everyone to our post-election group therapy session <laughs> with Stefan Schmidt and Arnie Arneson. I'm Catherine Perkins with Iowa Public Radio. And Stefan has some uh, folks he'd like to thank. Well, yeah, I want to thank, obviously, the, um, the sponsors, the uh, Political Science Club, the Ames Tribune, Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women in Politics, College Republicans and Democrats, and especially the Committee on Lectures funded by GSB, uh, who have been very wonderful to us. And, and I have to say I want to thank all of you as well because you've come out uh, to kind of demonstrate how, how huge a year this has been. And uh, this is your show. We're not going to give a lecture tonight. We are going to talk about some points, and then we want you to basically uh, steer the discussion. And, of course, I'm so thrilled that Arnie Arneson, whom you know by voice only, is finally uh, here physically in Ames. So thank you, Arnie. Can you disappear, please? I cannot handle watching you. I'm like, oh, my God, it's supposed to be a microphone, nothing more. Oh, my goodness. Well, um, Stefan and Arnie are our regular guests uh, Wednesdays on our Talk at 12 program on Iowa Public Radio, and that's how I've come to know them over the past year. They've been talking about this election process, which has lasted way too long for Iowa and New Hampshire. Um, so really, we want you to participate, and we want you to ask questions um, that maybe you've called and haven't gotten on the air, or maybe you've not had a chance to call, so don't be shy. Um, go up to the microphones and ask questions. And I think I'm just going to start by asking um, Stefan and Arnie, since we, our two states have been watching this election process the longest, how did you see things evolve over that, really, what was a two-year period, or, or longer, actually, for Iowa? Arnie, you want to start? You know, I, I, I have the three M's in my head, because it began with the magic, the machine, and the maverick. Think about that. Am I right? It, it is unbelievable when you go back, and, and, and I, I, I didn't know the name Magic for Barack Obama, but what I need to let you know is I was, it was, I think, end of December of 2006, and I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm talking to one of my students from Harvard, and he says, see, have you seen Barack yet? Have you seen Barack yet? I said, I've heard about him. He goes, watch him. He's got the magic. And I'm like, oh. And then you watch what unfolded for the course of the next almost two years. And what is remarkable about this election is that magic trumped machine and maverick. And I think that's the part where both Iowa and New Hampshire had such a crucial role in this election. Um, for those of you who were not able to be in Grant Park, I wept that Tuesday. I couldn't stop weeping. And part of the reason is, is that I'm 55 years old. This is the first time in my life anyone I ever voted for actually became a candidate. <laughs> I have to, I will, I'll admit it, I'll admit it. So you know what side of the political aisle I come from. So I'm sitting in Grand Park and I'm crying for a thousand reasons. But one of them is, I live to see this day. So, so it, it truly is, it is amazing. And yet at the same time as I look at those three M's, I think about what brought us into the polls in both in New Hampshire and to the caucus in Iowa was not what we ended up really looking at and talking about in the election in November. And, and, and really, who would have thunk it? And, and that, that the impression that you had with Barack Obama in Iowa held through all of that, through the change, through the challenge, and through the changing agenda. I mean, that's the part I think is the most remarkable. Uh, but I will tell you that I will take credit because I think New Hampshire is really the reason why Barack Obama is now president of the United States. <laughs> because what, what New Hampshire taught Barack Obama was how to lose. And as a result of learning how to lose is that he realized that he can't take anything for granted. He understood the nature of campaigns and it gave him an, almost an entire year to run against the most formidable candidate anyone have, could have fielded in a presidential campaign. And that kind of campaign made it possible for him to not only win the primary, but I believe it took that kind of campaign to make it possible for him to win the general election. If he had won New Hampshire, I'm not sure he would have won the presidency. But I think having lost, it really started to develop that muscle. Because I think presidential campaigns are about muscles. And he developed an amazing muscle. And we saw the result on that Tuesday. But uh, Stefan? 
Well, I, I, I agree with everything Arnie is saying, um, but I also think Even that, the New Hampshire part? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, New Hampshire always gives somebody, you know, a chance to recover from stumbling. In this case, it was McCain, uh, who was pretty much expelled from Iowa for various reasons and whose campaign collapsed. And if it hadn't been for New Hampshire, uh, somebody else would have been running. But to me, the interesting thing was that everyone, including myself, said oh, this is the worst thing that could happen to the Democrats. They've got Hillary Clinton, very strong, competing and winning. They've got Barack Obama challenging her. They're going to destroy each other. They're chasing each other all over the country. This is a disaster. Party can never win an election when they do this. And when we look back at it, what actually happened was that Hillary Clinton built a wonderful machine that ran a great campaign. Barack Obama was sort of the the guerrilla fighter who went to little states that had been neglected for you know the last 50 years that had never seen a presidential candidate you know and 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 people there turned out in enormous numbers in these little caucuses in 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 you know bad weather and felt that they were actually part of the process of picking the candidate for their party and what it did was it allowed them to get excited about the race. It gave them a stake in it. Instead of just Florida, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and that's it, and that's the only place anyone campaigns, they campaigned everywhere. Who would have thought that at the end of, you know, when the summer started, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were campaigning in Puerto Rico? You know, Puerto Rico it and was the weather. They wanted the weather. Come on, come on. <laughs> and so what, what the lesson to me from this was that we really need a process where the candidates have to campaign in all the states to make everyone feel included. And what it'll do is it'll produce a much greater turnout, greater excitement, a stronger democracy. And, and I think if we can re repeat that every four years, we will have done something terrific this year. I think both for the Republicans and Democrats. McCain's campaign was a little less strenuous because uh, he, the other candidates started dropping off for obvious reasons. But it was a great process. It was very frustrating, very long, very expensive. But, you know, this is a gigantic country. When we look at Europe, we always say, well, they can do it really quickly and cheaply. Well, yeah, but Belgium is the size of Story County. Of course they can do it cheaply and quickly. You know, this country is the size of all of Europe. And so it's going to be longer and more expensive. And I think it will be longer and more expensive for the foreseeable future. But if it can be a 50-state campaign, including Puerto Rico and Guam and, you know, District of Columbia and everywhere else, uh, it'll be a stronger <laughs> country. <laughs> yes. Well, but I think you're being a little bit naive. I think this was an unusual election. This was an unusual cast of candidates. I I'm not quite sure you're going to have this kind of a campaign ever again. Because you had, I mean, the Barack Obama campaign, nobody knew what to expect. And it was, it was so organized and so focused and so on message. It understood new media. It knew how to, it wasn't, it wasn't just having a campaign. It was growing voters. I mean, that was the amazing thing about this campaign, was it recognized if it was going to do a traditional campaign, they weren't going anywhere. So what they had to do is they had to find new people, find new ways of connecting. I keep describing Barack Obama's campaign as an octopus. It was constantly reaching out and bringing in, and reaching out and bringing in. It brought in money, it brought in volunteers, it brought in states, it brought in people. It was amazing. I don't know whether you're going to be able to get that 50-state campaign. I, think I, I, so. I, I just think this was so different I disagree, that that's part of the reason why it got to be played out. I think Sarah Sorry, Palin Catherine. and Joe the Plumber are going to be a 50-state circus that in a few more years I already got a letter from Sarah Palin oh this is incredible it's a I got it's true. This is a true. postcard and I said yes a postcard <laughs> but why I've never gotten anything from her saying you know do you want some catalogs we'd love you to visit Alaska and I'm going that's odd you know people in Iowa suddenly getting uh, communications from her I think I think there may be more lessons from this and I think the Republicans as you know we're going to talk about that I hope in a few minutes uh, where the Republican Party is going to go they're looking everywhere to see what the lessons are from this year because there were lots of things that didn't work obviously for the Republican Party and I think um, strategy organization viral uh, things such as the internet and YouTube and and uh, Twitter and glitter and fritter and, <laughs> you know, every kind of itter that you can find on the Internet, YouTube and, and uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, 
all the Republicans are going to be using. And I think um, this is going to become a strategy to go to all 50 states and get people excited in all 50 states because you need, you know, you need as much sort of, of a back backup if you don't win the states that you really think you need. Well, one of the things that we heard in questions from the floor. Let's do questions from the floor. Okay. Um, one of the things that you heard after this election is that Barack Obama has changed the electoral map. Do you think that's true? I think the economy has changed the electoral map. I think we all walked into the voting. What was that line I used today? We're all from Flint, Michigan now. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. I think, I, I'm not sure that it's a permanent change or even a temporary change. I think it's an economic change. And I think the problem for the Republican Party is you can't run a campaign on no when people are hurting puppies. You can't say no when they don't have a job. You can't say no when you don't have a 401k. You can't say no when they don't have health care. And the problem is so much of that agenda has been based on that idea of no regulation, no government, no taxes. Well, you know what? I don't have a job. You know, and I don't go to bed at night going, oh, my God, I'm so worried about those taxes. You're not paying them if you don't have a job. I mean, I'd rather be worried about paying my taxes because that means I'm employed. You know, so I, I, I think that's one of the reasons why the electoral map may have changed. I don't know how permanent a change it is, and I think the assumption that it's changed is probably a false assumption, and I think the Republicans know that as well, which is a smart thing, because that gives them four years to begin to reflect on what happened, not only during this election, but the last eight years, figure out how to reframe a message, and I'm gonna remind everyone what I said on uh, the radio today. Virtually every Republican governor that ran this year won. And they won by comfortable margins. Why? Because they don't say no. Because the buck stops there and they have to govern. And they have to govern well. And I think that lays an agenda for a really interesting campaign in 2012. And don't assume any state. But I think one of the things that, um, sorry, Catherine. No, um, all right. We'll do the same thing we do on the radio show, which is you are the host, but we always interrupt. Um, <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the, the things that you can say this year is we are now aware that it may not be so much the, um, you know, the, the strategy of the campaigns that have changed, but the United States has changed. One of the reasons the Republicans didn't do very well this year in the national election is because they did not see where the demographics are going. Uh, Hispanic voters this year in states like Nevada, Colorado, Florida, because there are now Hispanics in Florida who are not Cubans who always vote Republican, um, and a couple of other states voted more for the Democrats, and unless the Republicans seize on that demographic change, um, they're not going to be able to do very well. So the reason governors do well is because governors know their constituencies close to home and they can tailor their messages. I mean, there is a Republican governor who is very successful. Um, he doesn't look anything like the platform of McCain or, or Bush or other Republicans, but he's very successful. Why? Because he understands the, the demographics and the ideology of his state. Uh, and that's, for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, you know, you tailor your message to the constituency you have, you stress the issues that are important to them, you stay away from the things that scare people off and make them run away. And I think it's much easier to do that as a governor than as a presidential candidate. But, there, I mean, I come from New England, and, and the Republican Party is just frightened to death because there are no Republicans left in New England for the most part. And, and especially in my state, I mean, you have to understand that New Hampshire had been Republican forever. This was the place where the Republican Party came to rebuild, to lick its wounds, but now they can't even find a bathroom to hang out in. So it, it, it really is problematic, and it's not a good idea to basically walk away and say New England isn't part of the mix because... Again, it's part of a demographic that you can't assume isn't with you. And that's the problem. I mean, I know it's, it's you know, the, the sort of old school, you know, Harvard's, whatever. But, but I really do think that if you look at the demographic that ended up sticking with the Republican Party, it isn't a demographic that has a real vibrant future you know, without creating that diversity. You mentioned the Cubans. What was amazing about Florida was that the Cuban parents voted for McCain, but the Cuban children voted for Barack Obama. So it isn't even, you can't even name the flavor anymore because the next generation isn't doing what their parents were doing. So I do think it, it's a wake-up call to all of us. But I, I want to ask a question. Did Barack Obama win because he was a Democrat? 
Or are we also looking at campaigns that are not necessarily as much party infused as more like they're a little bit of independent contractors? That, that, that it really is about a little bit of the cult of personality. I mean, I asked my audience the other day, so he's going to run on ch his change. What does that mean? Anybody know? I when know. She, I've got some in my purse. When she, when she. But I'm just. I'm, but I'm just. I'm just. I mean. But we all have this emotional attachment to him. But the question is, he ran on change, and and it was a great message. Except, what does it mean? And and I think that's why this 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 cabinet that he's beginning to pick is beginning to give us a sense of. Oh, so that's what change meant, Hillary Clinton. You know. I mean, that's. So again, I, I'm I'm almost wondering, is it as much about party? Or really did it take that, that cult of personality at the top that, that John McCain clearly lost? Usually when she asks these rhetorical questions, I have to figure out a way to dodge them. But I think she's asking them of you. So anybody has any thoughts, just shout them out. Yeah, go ahead. And, and that's a, a very interesting observation because that's also the appeal of Sarah Palin. It's the fact that she has no experience, very little knowledge, <laughs> has, a has a... No, no. Jim. He is being it, funny. It, it, he it, is being funny. I'm not being funny because, you know, uh, <laughs> it's got to be that. What else could it be? I mean... Uh, I, Sarah Palin was the choice of focus on the family. Sarah, see, the problem is we did not know who Sarah Palin is or was. Well, she is, I guess. We did not she know is. Sarah Palin. <laughs> but the problem is there, were, there was a significant number of people who did know who she was. And because they did know who she was, they were very excited about her. As soon as her name was you know, put into um, display as the vice presidential candidate, they were, they were juiced. Because the one person they did not like or trust was John McCain. They, did, they couldn't trust him as far as they could spit. And what was killing them was that the guy that they didn't trust, John McCain, was delivering the perfect candidate, and she was going to be a heartbeat away from president. Isn't it amazing? None of their fundamentalist candidates, not the former governor of Arkansas, not Mitt Romney, no, none of them could have done something so perfect as John McCain. You know, so, so Sarah Palin has a very, very different raison d'etre than Barack Obama. And I do think, I'm, I agree with you about Barack, because I think what Barack had in an interesting way is why do governors always do so well in presidential campaigns? Because they have no votes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So here is Barack. No votes. <laughs> it was perfect. So he had kind of the chicness of a governor, although he didn't have that title, but he had the no votes of a senator, so he was able to, you know, sort of walk the walk on both sides. And, and you're right. He was new, but he was also incredibly articulate and incredibly thoughtful. And over the course of the campaign, he got better and better at what he did, which was really his test. Let's go over here first. Uh, don't you think the Democrats have Howard Dean to thank for his 50-state strategy and for the use of the inter internet? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Howard Dean uh, tried it, um, succeeded more than anyone else, failed to get the nomination. Um, but the idea was sound. Um, I don't know if Obama got the idea from him or not, but it certainly was um, a concept that he deserves a place in the next edition of my textbook. Where, <laughs> yeah, and we'll, I'll make sure that we put in there that it was thanks to Howard Dean's 50-state strategy um, that Obama decided to, to, to go to uh, little caucuses in North Dakota or somewhere. I can't remember where they all were, where there were no Democrats, actually, but all 300 of them showed up and were really enthusiastic. Uh, and that's, that's a great achievement. A actually, I actually think there's something more to what Howard Dean did. 
everyone thought the year before the caucus and the primary that Howard Dean would be the nominee. This unknown governor from a state the size of a suburb, you know, who, um, you know, nobody really knew, but, but caught on to an idea, the idea of the war. And he was able to transform so many people across the country. He stumbled in Iowa and couldn't recover. He screamed in Iowa. He, well, <laughs> he screamed in Iowa only when the camera saw it. But the people in the room did not see it. Nobody perceived it until the camera saw it and then it looped it and looped it. And if it was a million times, it was too many. And, and, I, and I think what, what Barack Obama saw was what Howard was able to do in that year before the caucus, before the primary. And I think he said, you know what? This is possible. It wasn't the 50 states. At that time, Obama didn't have a 50 state strategy. He had, do I have the guts to do it? Do I have the guts to do it? Do I have the guts to do it? It's too soon. It's too early. I'm an unknown. Can a maverick do this? But he saw what Howard Dean did in that year before. You know what I used to refer to John Kerry in that year before? I used to refer to John Kerry as the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, I mean, I buried him. I buried him. I thought there was no way he was going to get the nomination. And a lot of us thought that. So again, I think what Dean did is not that strategy of 50. It was that strategy of organizing and getting people excited mm -hmm. and using the internet to connect them together. That was important because then Obama could build on that and imagine him taking that agenda and moving it forward. Over here. Uh, yes, it seems to me that when the media is trying to evaluate uh, the outcome of elections, uh, that it focuses very often on demographics, strategy, campaign strategy, personality cults. I would like to think that Americans are also concerned about issues, mm -hmm. uh, and not only the, the economy, but also our foreign policy, which has been devastated over the last eight years. Um, you talk about change and what is change. It seems to me that has to be answered in the context of what has happened over the last eight years and maybe longer. Um, so the change has to be identified in those terms. I, I think that's a very, very brilliant observation. And I remember on the night before the election I, at, at CNN and Espanol, um, we were looking at, at the polls and at the numbers, and m my comment was, you know, Obama should be doing a lot better than this. Um, I mean, the Bush administration, the eight years of Bush, the 12 years of Republican control of the Senate, um, resulted in two wars that are devastating and inconclusive, uh, in disaster relief that was a disaster, in uh, budget uh, expenditures and deficits that exploded our national debt and in an economy that um, being deregulated the way it was presented a real disaster and began to crash. Obama should have done a lot better in the polls before and in fact I think he should have done a lot better uh, in the general election. Um, so why the issues didn't work for him as well as I thought they should is still a mystery but it was clearly uh, looking at the current administration and what it had not produced that made people say, well, we need somebody else. And even people who felt uncomfortable voting for Obama because they didn't know him and maybe even because he was black, uh, I think decided to vote for him. And a lot of Republicans didn't vote for him, didn't vote for McCain. They uh, turned on their TV and, you know, ha had a couple of beers or, you know, if they don't drink uh, some iced tea or something and just didn't vote that night. Uh, and that produced these results. So I, th I think uh, the issues were very important, uh, but Obama managed to make the most of the issues but with a superb organization and with an almost flawless campaign. So that's the combination. I, I wish the war had mattered more on November. I don't think it did. I think the war mattered for a lot of us in the very beginning in New Hampshire and in Iowa. I think it was the motivator. I think it distinguished the candidates for us. Um, I think we recognize the failure. The problem is, is that most Americans are not touched by this war. They have not been asked to pay for it. They don't have children sacrificing for it. Um, and and it, it's not theirs. They don't really see a sense of ownership of it. And as a result, it, it's not a decider for them. I mean, it turns out that, you know, 9-11, 
I, as I said before, it, we, what was the comment? We're all New Yorkers now. Most of you aren't. I am. The farther you got away from New York, the less sort of emotional impact it had on you because it wasn't personal. In a lot of ways, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, it isn't personal. It doesn't touch you. What happened with the economy? That's a different story. That's another kind of war. And it touched all of us. It touched us because we had 401ks. It touched us because we had houses. It touched us because we had bank accounts. And um, that's what was front and center when people walked into that voting booth. That doesn't mean that Barack Obama doesn't have to address this incredible problem. And I do, and I said this today, I, I do think one of the reasons why he is looking at Hillary Clinton and pick Joe Biden is that he understands he has to kind of bifurcate his approach um, with this next four years. Part of it is going to be someone that has to absolutely focus on foreign policy. But since nobody anticipated the kind of economic implosion, economic implosion we have, he's going to focus on the domestic policy and he needs to make sure that he has people that he can work with, and I'm hoping that if it is Hillary, he can work with her, that they will begin to focus on what is truly a fragile, fragile world stage. Over here. Yes, I'd just like to um, comment on one of my teacher's comments. Um, he said he expected Obama to do a lot better in the polls. Well. From my perspective and talking to my relatives and my accountant friends in Denver, um, their friends, my accountant friends, they're white, um, and I've known them for about 10, 15 years, their friends thought that Obama, if elected, would have some radical, earth-shaking change to the way America is run, basically dismantling the Constitution, taking back enabled rights, you know, and I'm just like, what are they talking about? You haven't bought your Glock yet? <laughs> <laughs> Just take a look at gun sales. What do you think? Well, I mean, it's great for gun sellers, but what's it premised on but something interesting? It doesn't make any sense, and I'm just like, he's a lawyer, okay? I mean, <laughs> constitutional lawyer. Yeah. Well, he's that right. should have disqualified him from being president in the first place. <laughs> you know, lawyers are even less popular than used car salesmen. But your point is interesting also because, um, in fact, of course, it is people looking at the Patriot Act, people looking at surveillance, people looking at the constriction of um, civil liberties in the United States in the past few years since September 11. That's where the Constitution is under threat. And so in some ways, at least, maybe what they were talking about was what had happened in the past because uh, if nothing else, people voted, I think, the way they did to try and balance out again the need for security um, in this country with the need to respect civil liberties and, and maintain that very careful balance that we have to have. So it's a kind of a curious conclusion that people reach. There was somebody over here, yeah, I yeah. think. Come yeah, come up to the microphone so we can hear you. Or just shout out really yeah, loud. Yeah, you can shout too. I, I think given what's happened on Wall Street that people aren't making that connection with the war and right now what's happening um, with the foreclosures and the credit default swaps and the bailout and the big, th I mean, I, I don't know how I'm going to blame the war on the big three. I mean, that, that's just, it's, it's just hard to make the connection. I do think, though, that people are hoping that we're going to be able to find some additional resources to start paying this bill. But the problem is, how much of this war have we paid for anyway? None. Okay? Yeah, the Chinese have been paying for this war. The Chi Actually, I think it was uh, two weeks ago or this week, the Japanese used to own most of the, the debt or the bonds in this country. The Chinese just surpassed them, uh, I think, in the last couple of days. So, so I, think, I think you're right in a way if we were talking months ago. I think right now the idea that we could get any benefit from bringing troops home financially is gone to the back of the bus because the enormity of the cost right now has so exploded that mythology. Over here. Okay. Um, we saw uh, when Republicans had complete power of the um, executive branch and the House and Senate that 
public policy may have not been as high quality. Do you think that'll happen now that Democrats are in charge of the elect um, sorry, the executive and um, legislative branches? Hmm. So when nobody can keep them in check. Uh, what do you think, Stephanie? No, I, I think that the Republicans were unusually unified and ideologically on the same page. And we're already seeing that the Democrats are not necessarily very unified. Uh, you know the Democrats. Did you say herding cats? Yeah, and, yeah. And the I'm Democrats. Making sure you got it right. When they when they circle the wagons to protect themselves, they start shooting at each other, not shooting outward. And we're seeing, for example, a huge fight in Washington between Democrats who want to bail out the uh, the, the three big auto companies and those who don't. And in fact, there's going to be a huge struggle over some very important committee chairmanships. Uh, where Democrats from California, who are very environmental, who are not interested in supporting General Motors, are going to challenge Democrats from Michigan, who are big supporters of the, the big three. And so I think the Democrats are more fragmented. Um, and if you look at some of the Democrats that got elected this time, yes, they have a D next to their name, but they're very conservative. They t they're often even pro-life, and they actually look more like what a Republican would look like. So I think there's going to be a lot more, let's call it sort of dynamic tension in, in the legislature. And actually, that was evidenced by the vote between Waxman and Dingell. I think that vote just came down today with it, was it called the steering committee. Waxman won by three votes. That basically means they were almost divided completely in half about this. Waxman sends a frightening message to the auto industry and a really scary message to the UAW, the United Auto Workers Union, that no longer will the chairman of that committee, you know, genuflect to the big three. And, and frankly, the more you look at Dingle with his wife being a GM executive, uh, I just, I mean, I'm, as a, as, a, as a Democrat, and on my business card it says politician in recovery. <laughs> and and what, I, what I want you know is I'm appalled that nobody talked about that, you know, a year ago, two years ago, whatever. That, that is unbelievable that someone should be put in that position of power and be so compromised. Uh, the country is not well served, and frankly, the Democratic Party is not well served by that. So I'm pleased to see that he won by three. But what does that tell you about the fact that they were still so divided on that issue? Okay. So should we get into the, uh, yeah, to the bailout? Anybody want to talk about the victory? Will there be an auto bailout? Here, let me look in my, I don't have a crystal ball, but. Here. Stare, stare into the water and I'll swirl um, it around for you. You know, it's, I don't know if there should be an auto bailout. Um, I have a feeling that there will be in the end an auto bailout because the, the threat to the remaining stability of the American economy and to three million jobs at least and maybe more has been put on the table. And the idea is that if the auto industry goes bankrupt, it'll be a domino effect. It'll take out a lot of the suppliers and dealerships, and it'll affect local and state governments. Uh, and it will only add to that s downward spiraling of the economy. So I'm guessing in the end they'll work out some kind of a bailout with strings attached, um, but it's going to be pretty tough. I mean, it's, it's just like the $700 billion bailout of the financial services industry, which, you know, they had to swallow it, you know, really hard. Um, but, they, but they finally swallowed it because the idea was it, it has to be done. It's not a good thing. It's going to prolong the transformation of the auto industry, which is always resistant. You know, the American auto industry has resisted every single innovation. They didn't want you know, safe gas tanks. They didn't want seat belts. They didn't want airbags. They didn't want catalytic converters. They fought the cafe standards and the mileage, improved mileage. They fought every single thing. And it was Chairman Dingell, largely, who was their, their you know, mouthpiece in Congress who managed to block a lot of that legislation. Um, and so, you know, it's, I, I think it, there will be a bailout, but it's it's not going to be very popular. But, but I have a real problem with the bailout because why right, we bailed out AIG and we bailed out some of the banks. Got credit yet? Got a house yet? How you doing with that foreclosure? And, the, and, and I, I said it today on the radio, I'm going to say it again. Trust but verify. The problem is we now have an experience with a really bad bailout. 
because everything, I mean, Congress was so naive. They thought if they came to their rescue that they would then do what bankers are supposed to do, loan money. But they didn't. They're buying up other banks. They're hoarding the cash. It's not their cash. It was our cash that was supposed to be used to infuse and go back into the economy, but it's not. So having experienced that bad bailout, and I'm looking at the big three with their hand out, not only do I want to slap it, but what I'm trying to figure out is, okay, so what's the quid pro quo? Does management get to say? They've been so enlightened for so long. You know, what do we get in return? And, and I, I've said this before, I think one of the best things we can do if you want, if the auto companies want help, here's what the first thing I do, raise the gas tax. Now let me tell you why. I raise the gas tax because one, that's how I'll, I'll use that money to bail you out. But by raising the gas tax, I'm also going to insist that you don't buy, build any more SUVs or Hummers. You need to know that I used to call SUVs FUVs. And I still think they're true. But the problem is I don't want you to build them anymore because I don't, because, and if I raise the gas tax, I ensure that you're not going to slip back in to the idea that you can drive 80 miles to the, you know, 80 miles an hour and get a car that has 12 miles to the gallon. So isn't it interesting? It would make a complete circle. You would use the gasoline dollar to help bail out the auto industry with lots of interesting sort of strings and accountability attached. But it would also ensure that we don't fall back into the idea that efficient cars are not really the necessity of our future. Not only our future because we're so worried about the price of oil, but really worried about our environment. It's a, you know, this crisis is a gift, everyone. This crisis is a gift. We never change unless we're on the precipice. And the best part of this is that we have to change on so many different levels because we know about global warming. We know it's happening faster than it's anyone ever thought possible. We know now that we are interconnected because this, this economic downturn took place worldwide. Worldwide, we are attached to each other and it turns out that the weak link was us. We were the weak link. No one ever thought that it would be the United States that would bring everyone to their knees, but we did. So this is such a golden opportunity. Even as I watch them asking for help, I keep thinking that means I have the upper hand. But there's also a problem because our entire model of how we progress and prosper is based on consumption. And consumers going to buy stuff is 70 plus percent of the gross domestic product of the economy of the United States. And so if we're going to make a shift from one thing to another, whether it's um, you know, big box stores and people buying a lot of imported goods or whether it's large cars or whether it's importing gasoline, um, when we shift to something else, uh, what is that going to be? Uh, you know, we have to have some concept of how we drive the economy, where we create jobs, who creates those jobs, how we do those jobs. And I guess having seen central planning and sort of government deciding what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, I am a little bit apprehensive, Arnie, to turn this all over to your socialist friends and have them... <laughs> oh, maybe in New Hampshire. That's sorry. Vermont. No, I'm sorry. That's I Vermont. I can handle it's a, it's it. A, it's I a, can it's handle it. It's the other little insignificant state up there in New England. Um, it, you know... When the government decides how to do things, very often, if you look at, uh, you know, Alitalia and you look at some of the, the European countries, um, you know, that didn't work very well either and they stagnated. And, you know, in Germany, I have a cousin who has been unemployed in the German steel industry for about 28 years. 28 years. So um, we are at a cutting edge. It's exciting. We're going to be moving new directions. But the price of gas today, Arnie, what was it at that gas station when we went by? Oh, there? it was a buck eighty-three or okay. a buck seventy-seven. You're, you're like, gonna, you're gonna see, afford, we won't even notice a dollar. You can afford to drive a Humvee at a buck, you know, fifty or a buck eight, that or at two dollars a gallon. You can easily afford to drive a Humvee, and so these things are all you know, essentially dependent on each other. And I remember during the energy crisis in the 70s when the, when the Arab countries cut off oil supplies because we supported Israel, um, the one thing we said was, oh my God, oh my God, we got a ration gas. Jimmy Carter printed ration cards. They were ready. They're in a warehouse in Washington, D.C. still today. We told the auto industry, you've got to build smaller cars. The auto industry Stephen, rushed. Stefan, we're global warming. The, the, it's the, the different today, rushed. Stefan. It's not the 70s. The auto it's industry. polar bears. It's melting ice caps. <laughs> <laughs>
India, come on. The auto industry rushed out and built smaller cars, Arnie. Oh. And you know what? The oil crisis ended. The Arab countries sent us oil. The price of gas went down. You know, they lost money on those smaller cars. You know, we essentially send these signals to industries like the auto industry. And then when they end up failing because that didn't work out, they don't trust us to tell them what to do either. Let's, you know, thank you so much, Stefan, for the navel gazing. <laughs> um, I would like to say um, we had very little choice in bailing out the banks. Um, we had very little choice, uh, as ugly as the AIG thing came out. Um, and then we watched the uh, Ford executives fly in on their jets <laughs> to come mm -hmm. talk to uh, to Washington. I, I would. I'm glad to hear your opinion on it, stuff. but I'd like to know everybody else's opinion. It, would you want the bailouts? I, can we have a show of hands? Who wants the what? bailout? Who wants Which bailout? bailout? Which bailout? bailout? Which bailout? bailout? For, th for, the, for uh, the big three? For the big three. Okay. Just show that. Hands. Never mind Should the we others. bail out the big three? Who wants a bailout yes. for the big three? This is yes. With well, strings okay, we're attached, with strings or strings attached. That's okay. Strings, strings can be attached. Okay, so who, who doesn't want the bailout? Hmm. No bailout. I'm calling my congressman That's now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let yeah. me text message that to Tom Harkin here real quickly. Uh, <laughs> Take a picture of the show of hands. That would be good. Yeah. That's that right. Could. Yep. Yeah. We remember. You know, it, it was a loan. It was repaid. The federal government actually made money on interest rates, and you know, it worked. It worked okay. But now Chrysler is back. You know, staring over the edge of a cliff. So, I guess what do we have to do this every twenty-five years? Yeah. It's just. I mean, now the auto companies are saying we just want a line of credit because we can't pay our bills because the you know the credit market is frozen up. So. Just give us a bridge loan here. We'll repay it. And, you know, now they're even saying, well, you can attach some strings. But one of the strings they don't want is that the executives of the auto companies, um, you know, have to say bye-bye. And I don't know what other executives are going to be put in place. I mean, who's going to decide who is going to be the executive? Because if, if the federal government starts doing that, then the auto companies become the property of the U.S. government, and you and I own them, which I shudder at, at, at that idea. But... There's another question over here. We solved it. Okay. <laughs> Next issue. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. When the uh, auto industry first asked for a bailout, they wanted $25 billion for R&D money to design new efficient engines. If the kids go to the library and check out uh, Scientific American, September 2007, there's a full-page article in there. Uh, General Motors are the corporate citizen of the year in Turin, Italy. In 2005, they got the Automotive Engine of the Year Award for the new high efficient uh, diesel engines they're running over there. When you go to Ireland, they have these engines everywhere. <coughs> they have them in France. But we don't have those motors here yet, and they're on the road over there. So are you suggesting that the <coughs> $25 billion for innovation was actually a lie? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure I was clarified here that that's what it was. That, but, but I don't know if you were, I, I, last week I talked about it, there was an article in Salon.com about a week ago uh, about apparently during the Clinton administration, the big three spoke to Clinton and said, look, don't improve cafe requirements, don't do anything, give us a billion dollars towards innovation, and we promise you that by 2004 we're going to have a car that gets 80 miles to the gallon. That was the handshake and promise with the Clinton administration. Of course, you know Al Gore didn't win in 2000, and guess what? Innovation, what, here's where they put the money in innovation. They decided to go from 
you know, zero to 60 instead of in 14 seconds, in nine seconds. Mm -hmm. That was their innovation. I don't know about you, but it doesn't really help me get to work. So it's, uh, but that, that's probably not surprising. Is that a side hand over here? Somebody who hasn't asked a question? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And are you are you referring to the issue of reproduction or are you referring to the issue of immigration? Because for the United States, um, I mean, we're, we're not reproducing significantly, but immigration can change that conversation very quickly based on the nature of immigration. And, and that, that is, I think, for the United States, the big gorilla in the room. Yeah. Well, <laughs> w uh, yeah, you people need to die off quicker so that we can we can have a you know a, a much slower. No, we're, we're going to take care of that because we're not going to fully fund Medicare anymore. So guess what? You're not going to a doctor. I'm just saying, 65. You can call me in five years, and I'll get you an appointment. Well, I, know, I mean, <laughs> at least we used to have smoking that killed off a lot of yeah. people. Now we've done away with that. And and you, you know these Save Democrats a country, smoke a pack. have put in all. <laughs> <laughs> you know we got all these safety standards on cars, so the cars are much safer. But no, I seriously, I, I think population is to some extent a bogus issue because you know in Europe, for example, the population density is much much greater than in the U.S., but their standard of living is much higher because they do different things with people. People are put to work better. They're educated better, trained better. They have better health care, and they reduce the level of impact that that population has on the environment by having essentially uh, smarter technology, by having different systems that uh, don't uh, pollute as much. Um, and, and you can have much greater impact with smaller population in countries where people basically go out and clear, you know, clear cut the rainforest. Be, even though there aren't a lot of people, they're clear cutting the rainforest because that's how they make a living. So, you know, I think the question of how many people the planet Earth can sustain, we can't solve that here tonight because that discussion has been going on for a long time. But I do know that many years ago when I was in graduate school at Columbia University, the idea was we were running out of resources, and it was a very famous study by a couple of people at, at MIT uh, who said, you know, look, you know, where population is growing this fast, we're using up resources this fast, we're going to run out of oil, gas, copper, steel, and so on. Well, the year we were going to run out of that was 10 years ago. And we haven't not only not run out of it, but we found better ways to recycle, to reuse things, and so on. So I think population is a big problem when that population you know, is not working in a way that is sustainable. And I think large numbers of people can live on, on the planet sustainably, or they can live on the planet and, and pretty much wreck it. And, and that's our, our big challenge, I think. And I do think education and economic opportunity also addresses some of the issues about population, because the more educated a population is, it turns out the fewer children they have. So if you sprinkle education like fairy dust, you might actually notice that the size of families gets reduced. So that might be important. But I think there's a bigger girl in the room right now that we have to look at for the next five years, and let's focus on the United States. And, and I want to talk a little bit about this. And what brought us to our knees was real estate. All right. And I got to ask a question. It used to be the American dream was the house and the picket fence. Is it time for us to rethink that as a country? Can we start talking a little bit about home ownership? What does it mean? How many houses should you own? The size of the houses you own? The fact that you're flipping your house? The fact that you're using your house as an ATM machine? I think we need to go back to the drawing boards and reestablish what we mean by home. 
Well, I mean, look at the size of houses alone. You know, uh, a number of years ago, the average house was like 900 to 1,000 square feet. It's now doubled that as the size of families have gotten smaller. So what are you doing with that extra space? I know you're consuming because you probably need it for closets. But, 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 but no, I, I, I think we really need, because we've been sold this idea that we define ourselves by the fact that we own a home. A and the reason why I really also want to question that is that if you look at this new economy, I, I always start with the fact that my grandfather worked at the same job for 50 years. He worked for the AMP. My father worked at the same job for 40 years. He was a New York City schools teacher. I'm 55, I've had 32 jobs. <laughs> now, part of the problem is, is that in this new economy, we need to be nimble. That probably means we're not going to necessarily you know, be raised and raise our kids and live and die in the same location because the nature of work is going to be that way. But the problem is you sometimes are stuck whether you want to leave or not because you can't unload that house because that house now means you're wedded to that environment. It's now not an asset. It's a huge liability. And what we've seen, especially with, with even our tax policy, we don't, we give you a homeowner, you give that, that home deduction, right? That deduction for your interest rate. Wait a minute, for a million dollar house? That's not a home, that's a palace. You know, I mean, again, I think this is the opportunity given this crisis and that the whole idea of home and real estate drove it means that we have to go back to the drawing boards and look at our tax policy. What did we encourage? We have to look at what we really mean by, by, by having a home and is renting an option that really we should consider. Someone said the other day that one of the best answers to this foreclosure problem would be to tweak the bankruptcy laws and allow folks not to be evicted, but to rent their home for five years, and then at the end of the five years have an option to acquire it. That would be amazing. It would stop the hemorrhage. It would stop the evictions. It would really bring banks to the table. But we have this idea that we're wedded to this idea of the past that I'm not sure works not only in this economy, but clearly is not working for uh, the kind of investment we've made where we've over-invested and it blew up in our face. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna kind of switch gears on you a little bit. That's okay. Good. Um, I'm actually a non-interventionist conservative, so I'm kind of in exile right now. But uh, <laughs> uh, as far as economics go, I have to support free market solutions to the majority of our problems, but uh, I'd like to ask my question in the area of uh, uh, foreign policy. Uh, with the new Obama administration, I do feel there is some hope at revisiting some of the uh, foreign policies we have towards, in specific, uh, the Middle East and Latin America. Uh, what are your thoughts on any possible changes we could see, say, towards the uh, Cuban, uh, yeah, the Cuba situation? No. I think it is a good opportunity to essentially revisit some things. Uh, U.S.-Cuban foreign policy has been the best thing that could happen to the Castro administration. And I know that Raul Castro was praying, which he doesn't do very often, that John McCain would become president. Because then the United States would continue to be an adversary, there would continue to be embargoes on Cuba, and it would be a belligerent relationship, which makes it much easier for a government like the Cuban government to maintain control. You know, if you don't have an external enemy, uh, then you got to really explain why you have the kinds of domestic policies that you have. And so I think in, in terms of Latin America in general and Cuba, Cuba, um, you know, walking around with a big stick, which Teddy Roosevelt did, um, is, works much less well than doing what, for example, John F. Kennedy did with the Alliance for Progress, with the Peace Corps, and so on. Uh, American foreign policy was much more influential in Latin America when the U.S. respected Latin America, respected the diversity and the differences between our policies and theirs, and tread much more softly. And I think uh, that may also be true from all of the experts that you're seeing coming forth now in places like Afghanistan where um, the whole idea is we probably could stabilize Afghanistan if we pull back and invest in, in helping them build schools and clean water supply and, and sources of employment rather than using unmanned drones to kill terrorists from the air, which also kills a lot of civilians, and you get uh, essentially 
uh, you get uh, two or ten dead terrorists and a and hundred really angry citizens who then turn against the United States. And I think I, Obama is going to probably go in a different direction. And I see Obama also emphasizing Latin America a lot more um, just from the kind of people that I've talked to who have worked with his campaign, uh, much more of an emphasis on um, essentially diplomatic relations. So. And I think the military recognizes that perhaps the, a soft power approach is going to be much more effective. They made so many mistakes in Iraq, and Iraq taught them that they actually needed to be more like community action programs than like military outfits. And, and that's another reason why the State Department is so important, because that's what, that's what the Secretary of State really needs to do, is they need to rebuild that State Department, because that is, that is our arm for that soft power. That is the opportunity for diplomacy. And, and I think people, although he said he was going to be tough because that's the expectation, he really did stress the diplomacy angle. And, and I, I do hope that we've had eight years of experience and we've, we've used the military approach. Um, it blew up in our face. Now is a real opportunity. If this is part of the change agenda, then I think you're going to see a soft power approach. We've probably got time for one more. Um, yes, my comment is regarding the bailout. Now, I've listened to the Sunday morning talk shows. Um, the media, Congress, everybody is missing a point. From the accounting standpoint, no one is following GAAP. If they were following GAAP, these, these problems that we're currently facing would have shown up a long time ago. Sarbanes-Oxley dictates when something like this is happening, okay, you're supposed to contact the SEC. No one did that. We just, this all just bloomed up at once. Mm -hmm. My accountant friends, we're just, like, we're just like, wait a minute, Sarbanes-Oxley says you can't do this, that, there, and the other, but still and yet they did this, that, that, and the other, and all of a sudden we hear in the news, oh, we need money, we're going to fail. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, I think that is the tragedy of the fact that we essentially tried a policy that said, you know, regulation isn't very good if you just cut business loose and let them do business and don't, you know, peek over their shoulder all the time at their books, they're going to be able to innovate and do new things and so on. And unfortunately, a lot of Democrats even fell for, for that idea. And it, like anything else, yes, you don't want to overregulate, but if you let people just play with other people's money and you don't ask them what they're doing with it, uh, they're probably going to take risks and those risks were much too great. There is a lot of corruption also in the United States. The companies that rate uh, corp <laughs> well, I mean, the companies that rate corporations. If you go out and buy stock, you want to know what uh, Standard and Poor's or Moody's or somebody like that thinks of that company. Those companies are supposed to scrutinize the value of, of stocks and of a company and give you good investment advice. And apparently those companies failed us completely just like the accounting firms failed us. They were in cahoots with the corporations. They were much too easily influenced by the corporations that they were supposed to independently rate. And so what we need is to get back to a situation in which, yes, the free market is good and has to you know, bring the prosperity to us that we expect from it. But they also have to have a little fear factor injected into them that when they screw up, um, God bless them, as Sarah Palin would say, we, we ought to arrest them and maybe send them to Guantanamo and, and, and have them waterboarded a little bit to see where that money is hidden. Because, you know, we're going to empty out uh, Camp Gitmo pretty soon, and there's going to be plenty of space and a lot of very well-trained people who can you can get that information out of them. So, but, you know, wh one of the things that, that really bothers me is that I, I come from a very conservative family, and I've heard it from my Republican friends over and over again. The idea of the ownership society, and that was one of the rationales for people buying houses. But you know what we forgot to do? We forgot to understand that ownership required two to tango. That I want you to own a house, I want you to own the mortgage. I mean, that was the big. Think about it. You won't lend to someone if you think they're not going to pay you back. But if it doesn't bother you that they're not going to pay you back because you're never going to own that piece of paper because you're going to chop it up and you're going to sell it off and you're going to have it multiply and then, you know, mo it's like, you know, it's a mortgage on steroids, but it's never yours. They never own the responsibility. So isn't it amazing? The, uh, the idea of owning something is correct, but you have to have both sides buy in. Because if only one side is told that they own and the other walks away, the system fails. And it was so obvious. The problem is when you're making money, nothing is obvious. 
you know, and, and you would have thought that after the Arthur Anderson failure, that we would have learned some lessons. Isn't it amazing that we are incapable of learning lessons? And we had just experienced it with the whole Enron global crossing. And to see that we now have it and it's overwhelming the economy to me is, is almost an embarrassment. Well, the thing is you can't allow the system to become so innovative and so entrepreneurial that it actually destroys capitalism. I mean, you know, that's the irony of it. Uh, you know, at, at the extreme end of, the, of this free market, you actually produce a system that undermines capitalism and, and raises questions about its viability. So, Are we going to keep going? We, we have a couple more. <laughs> couple more. So let's take a couple of more. Because they could go uh, all night, people, there, I'm we'll telling you. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, wait. Back in the back, I think, was first. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to try yeah, to go this way. We've seen some hands up there. And okay. Okay. I don't you. think women, I, wait, wait, I want to say something. No one's putting this country down. I think this is such an incredible opportunity. I am so excited. It makes me crazy because I see all the things we could do. Frankly, I want the big three to get the bailout. I want them to start building light rail. That's a form of transportation. Go for it. I mean, there are, there are so many things that we can do. I want to see us go into infrastructure. And what is the infrastructure? I want us to weatherize every house in America. Think of all those unemployed construction workers. They're not going to be building another shopping mall, honey. They're not going to be building another house, so they might as well fix my house. And you know what? I mean, think about this. We could seal every envelope. We could create all this alternative energy. These are jobs that will stay home. This will improve our environment. This will get people back to work. And in the long run, we will have a sense of generational ethics. Because what we will be doing will not be just about today, but it will be about the future. We forgot that message. That's a message that was part of what our parents did. I think it's time we do the same. It is such an amazing opportunity. And, and E.J. Dion is right. I I hope that Barack Obama thinks big and reaches far. And the other thing is what we're putting down are unsuccessful policies that have undermined this country's ability to be a great country. Mm -hmm. That's what we're criticizing. And we were not permitted to do that very much for the past eight years. The whole idea was if you criticize the administration, then you're being anti-American and un-American, and you have some idiot congresswoman in Minnesota who wanted to start an, uh, a committee to investigate un-American activities by members of Congress. You know, w criticism is the one way, whether it's a corporation, a university, a school, a business, or a country, that allows you to examine the things that are failing and improve them. And I think um, that's what we're doing, and we're hoping that it'll be successful. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, the governors mm -hmm. at the Republican Party is totally looking to for their next candidate. Um, some of them actually expanded health care to children, have env environmental records that aren't so happy. Uh, the one governor got 30% of the black vote, astronomical in Republican terms. Are they going to be allowed to run on that platform on the national stage? Will the conservatives of the Republican Party let them run? And my second question is, in 2010, we have the 2004 senators up, and the Democrats lost eight of the nine contested seats that year. I, don't, I think they can take the Senate with a filibuster-proof Senate then, if they don't do it now. If they don't screw up, do you think they can? <laughs> The answer is yes to the to the Senate question. The answer is probably not to the first because the base of the Republican Party is so hardcore conservative, opposed to a lot of issues, wants to raise the divisive social issues that are very important to them. I, you know, if they're important to them, they have to raise them, and that makes it impossible for a national candidate on the Democratic ticket to have a you know softer approach to things and to say let's not talk about the things that are going to divide and scare away people and that's why McCain in part I think lost because he had he, he felt he had to play to the base of the party and if he had picked somebody else as his running mate you know several people were rejected who might have made it 
perhaps a little closer race, he probably still would have lost. But they were rejected because they were uh, pro-choice. And, and, you know, so the United States is the very divided on those issues. And if the Republican Party for its national candidates wants to talk about those hardcore divisive issues, it's going to be hard to win national elections. But that's what makes Mike Huckabee, I think, such an interesting candidate. Uh, because Mike Huckabee, if you look at his uh, agenda when he was governor of Arkansas on children's health issues, he was fabulous. He was the only governor to mention the word infrastructure during any of the debates early on. He's right. So he does yep. have yep. the social agenda that will appease the Christian right, but he also has a governing agenda. See, that's what's missing. You have to have a governing agenda. That's what Bobby Jindal said at the Republican Governors Association. We can't just say no. And he really talked about the fact that we have ideas more than earmarks, you know? And I think that what you saw with Mike Huckabee was interesting because I think he was a fascinating blend of the ability to govern and still for at least the, the social conservatives, uh, at least appeal to them on, the, on their agenda as well. Uh, I'm not sure that he will be around four years from now, but it'll be interesting to find out whether they can find a candidate who can marry both. And one more. That's Arnie's question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the problem is that there have been so many different numbers thrown around, and in fact, uh, 700 billion was the, the, you know, that original number. Then, uh, you know, I said, you know, if you add up some of the other bailouts, it's a trillion dollars. By the way, real quickly, if any of you are my students and you're going to write something up, the secret word tonight is agenda setting. So that's the, the secret word agenda setting all right put that put that in your smartphones so you know the the question here is who is going to do the prosecuting is it going to be the bush administration no because they're pretty much done and they'll all be gone so is it going to be the obama administration i'm not sure that they're going to go that route because barack obama wants to build essentially a consensus based coalition he wants needs the republicans to support his agenda and you know if you start going that direction you're going to create uh, bad feelings. And in this country, a couple of billion dollars here or there. It, trillion. 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 A couple of trillion dollars here or there. <laughs> and, you know, and pretty soon you're talking about money. But, you know, it, we, we waste a lot of money in, in many other ways. And I, I think, I, I mean, are you saying bank accounts in the Bahamas and things like that? I don't know. We're going to have to get uh, the Interpol on that one, I well, think. I, I think the most important thing is the, is the idea of transparency. And I think that has been totally missing for the last eight years. And, and, and I actually believe that Republicans get that too. And if it is trillions, as you say, I think Barack Obama has an, an agenda that he can actually follow on the idea of transparency. It isn't a gotcha. It's who's got it. You know, and that's really, um, and it, since it is our money, we have, I, I think, clearly the opportunity and, and the right to have that transparency. That's one of the reasons why I, I was actually thinking about bankruptcy with the big three, because the beauty of bankruptcy is that you can see the money. It's a very transparent process, and I have been so longing for the idea of being able to know what the hell we're doing. I want to thank everybody for coming um, very much.